and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Midnight Ride. I am your host, David Carrico, and it's my great honor, as it always is, to be here on Now You See TV and on the Midnight Ride with my good friend, John Pounders. This evening, we're going to have a fascinating ride. It's going to be entitled, The Quest for the Staff of Nimrod and the Rod of Moses, and it will be a fascinating ride indeed. So moms and dads, boys and girls, get ready to vanquish evil because we are now live, live, live. How's it going, David? <laughs> it's going great, John. It's great to be here as always. We had to sit out last week because of the weather, but we're back and the ice is gone, so it's all good. Yeah, man, I'm excited. I know last week I was bummed out that we didn't get to go live because this was the topic last week, and I was like stoked because this is probably to me probably one of the most interesting. Inter- I mean, to me, I, I know a lot of people aren't interested in the same thing I am, but I'm big like Raiders of the Lost Ark fan. You know, all the Indiana Jones fans and all that. You know, for all that stuff, the mysteries and and everything. So this is to me right up my alley, man. So I'm excited. Yeah, it really is, and this study is going to bring in so many aspects from um, non-canonical texts. We're going to be looking at traditions that are very ancient, that are going to teach us a lot, and like as we always do, we're going to be looking at it in the light of Scripture. The Bible says it's the honor of kings to search out a matter, and I love doing it, and we can do that with the Word of God, so it's always our great honor to do that and to do that with our great Midnight Ride audience. Well, David, take us on the ride, man, and I'll be popping in here and there to to do it. I know you guys, Donna, put together a nice slide, um, slide show for us and everything like that, so I'm excited. She really did, and Sister Donna done a tremendous job putting together great PowerPoint. Uh, kudos to her for that. So we're going to begin the ride and we're going to be searching out the matter and going on an investigation and a quest for the staff of Nimrod and the rod of Moses. And there's a biblical concept that underlies our search. And this is one of the premises that we want to have in mind as we begin to unpack these ancient traditions. And this is the concept of... God being the original and Satan being the imitator. And we know from Scripture, Isaiah 40 and 11, He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young. We know what the Gospels say. Yeshua said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth this life giveth his life for the sheep. And one of the most blessed concepts in Scripture, the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, is of the Father and Yeshua being our shepherd. And of course, there's the counter, there's the lie, there's this tradition of the counterfeit shepherd. And we've always had this throughout time. There have been the true shepherds and the false, and we're going to see this symbolized by the rod and the staff. And we're going to be breaking these parallel traditions down. And the the way this study is going to take us is going to be really amazing. 
in Scripture in Zechariah 11 and 16, in a Scripture that is foreshadowing the false prophet. It says, For lo, I will raise up a shepherd in the land which shall not visit those that be cut off, neither shall seek the young one, nor heal that that is broken, nor feed that that standeth still, but he shall eat the flesh of the fat and tear their claws in pieces. This is the idle shepherd in Zechariah. And this shows us this concept of the true and the imitation. So this is something that in all of your biblical studies, you'll always see this, the, the imitation of Satan. And, of course, this is Psalm 23. Hey, David, keep that mic close to you while you turn. You can turn it, but okay. just keep it close to All you. right, I'll try to stay right up on that little rascal. But in Psalm 23, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff. They comfort me. Of course, this is one of the most blessed uh, texts in Scripture. And there's basically little difference between a rod and a staff. The rod is usually more for discipline and the staff for guidance, basically. And the rod is just a straight stick, basically. And the staff has the hook on the end, oftentimes called the cross ear. And in the book of Jasher, we're going to begin here. And we're going to be taking the tradition in the book of Jasher. And in the book of Jasher, I... Uh, hold it to be written by a godly hand with some very godly ancient traditions in it that are quite valuable. Now, I do not hold it to be a scripture. I don't hold it to the high esteem I do the book of Enoch, but yet I believe it preserves godly traditions that we can learn a lot from. And this tradition of the rod of Moses that's preserved in Jasher we're going to use that, and we're going to be paralleling that with other traditions that show the other the other side's story, if you will. But let's read uh, from the book of Jasher, chapter 77. And Ruel commanded Moses to be brought out of the dungeon, so they shaved him and changed his prison garments and ate bread. And afterwards, Moses went into the garden of Ruel, which was behind the house, and he there prayed to the Lord his God, who had done mighty wonders for him. And it was that whilst he prayed, he looked opposite to him, and behold, a sapphire stick was placed in the ground, which was planted in the midst of the garden. Now, if this was in the book of Genesis, I would say, this really happened. Moses really went out in the garden. In the book of Jasher, I don't believe this actually happened, but it's a metaphor. It's a story that's teaching an ancient tradition and a truth. Yep. And this rod is a metaphor for the authority of God. And of course, in Scripture, that's what Moses' rod. It, it was the authority. And reading on here in book 40, in book 40, chapter, verse 40, of uh, Jasher 77, it says, And he approached the stick, and he looked, and behold, the name of the Lord God of hosts was engraved thereon, written and developed upon the stick. And you see, the rod represents the authority of the name of God. And he read it, and stretched forth his hand, and he plucked it like a forest tree from the thicket, and the stick was in his hand. And this is the stick with which all the works of our God were performed after he had created heaven and earth and all the host of them, seas, rivers, and all their fishes. And we see here, as the story goes deeper, the authority of the name. And, you know, this isn't like some people think of... Uh, they do, they think in terms of an evocation, you know, like the old um, nursery rhyme, Rumpelstiltskin. You know, if they could pronounce Rumpelstiltskin's name, they'd get the power. You know, that's not what we're talking about. Right. That's an evocation. And we're talking about authority that comes through relationship. And the stick was not magical, but it represented the authority 
of the relationship in the Hebrew and the Christian scriptures. This is an important concept. In Proverbs 18 and 10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous, righteous runneth into it and is safe. And Yeshua said in the Gospels, For I say unto you, Ye shall not see me henceforth till ye shall say, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. So we see and understand the metaphor of what the rod means, and we understand this parallel, the truth of God, and this counter tradition that is the imitation. And we're going to be unpacking this uh, in these ancient texts. Now, in uh, verse 43, of Jasher 77. It says, And when God had driven Adam from the Garden of Eden, he took the stick in his hand and went and tilled the ground from which he was taken. And this is the tradition behind the rod of Moses that it came from the Garden of Eden. And the stick came down to Noah and was given to Shem and his descendants until it came into the hand of Abraham the Hebrew. And when Abraham had given all he had to his son Isaac, he also gave to him this stick. And when Jacob had fled to Padanaram, he took it into his hand, and when he returned to his father, he had not left it behind him. In verse 48, it says, And after the death of Moses, the nobles of Egypt came into the house of Joseph, and the stick came into the hand of Ruel the Midianite, and when he went out of Egypt, he took it in his hand and planted it in his garden. And all the mighty men of the Kenites tried to pluck it when they endeavored to get Zippor his daughter, but they were unsuccessful. So that stick remained planted in the garden of Ruel until he came who had a right to it and took it. And when Ruel saw the stick in the hand of Moses, he wondered at it, and he gave him the daughter of Zipporah for his wife. Now, here we see the godly ancient tradition. All these guys, they come up, they try to pull the stick out, they can't do it. Moses comes up and pulls it out. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? It is. What yeah. is this? Well, of course, this is King Arthur, isn't it? This is King Arthur and Excalibur. And here we get our first of many glimpses that in this ancient tradition of the rod of Moses, it's counterfeited. It's counterfeited throughout time in many ancient traditions. And what we see in the book of Jasher, which is the preservation of an ancient godly tradition, it's mimicked in the story of the Knights of the Round Table. This is Excalibur, and I think we've probably all heard this story of um, when Lancelot, he was he was worthy, so Lancelot was able to pull out the sword. Now, and then David, just uh, to kind of cut in for a second. Well, you go right ahead, John. You're reading those scriptures, and and you know I've been doing a kind of a parallel study on the coat. You know the the coat that supposedly was passed down from Adam and Eve, made out of the the animal skins, all the way to Noah. Noah gets it taken by Ham. Um, Ham gives it to Nimrod. Esau cuts Nimrod's head off. Jacob gets it, or um, Isaac gets it, passes it on to Jacob. Jacob passes it on to Joseph as the coat of many colors. And this is at least the, the theory, right, behind it. Passes on his coat of many colors, and then we don't see it again, which, and I'll get into some of that, but uh, I'll give you guys a clue, okay? So there's only one other place in the Bible where it talks about a robe dipped in blood. And they and when his brothers took him and sold him into slavery, they took his coat of many colors, they dipped it in goat's blood, and they gave it to her dad and said he was dead. And it ties in with his piece of atonement. It ties in with when Yeshua returns in the cloud with the robe dipped in blood, not soaked in blood or had blood on it because he got killed, a robe dipped in blood. So this is this yeah. is so interesting to me because all this these it is parallel. So And I think we'll probably have to do an entire show. On the coat yes because it's the same thing with the coat as with the rod 
there are the parallel traditions. Yep. And when you study this, you get a deeper revelation. And, you know, we, we talk about the literal meaning of the text and amen. But there's also metaphors. And a lot of people are so strict on the literal literal meaning that they miss the metaphor. Mm -hmm. And there are the people that they get the metaphor, but not the literal. We right. need to get both. Yep. And this powerful pictures and revelation, the same thing that is there with that. And it's it's just an unbelievably blessed study. I'm excited too because I don't. I've never. I, I haven't. I know there may be somebody out there. People are always like, "Well, this person said." It, but I've never heard anybody really get into that stuff and really kind of no. connect that i've never and, and it no. was just by chance that stuff that you're talking about is not necessarily by chance because nothing happens by chance but it's interesting how when you study things and you start looking all these puzzles start fitting yeah. together and you see things that you've never seen in scripture or anything yeah. and it's just amazing really it is it is and you know the scripture says it's the honor of kings that search out a matter and we can with the word of god search these matters out and it makes not just sense but dynamic revelation now we're going to see here the counter tradition and this comes from a book called the book of the bee and the book of the bee was written in the year 1222 by a nestorian bishop named solomon budge that's yeah, quite a name in it, Solomon Budge. Sounds like a character in a movie. Yeah. But, you know, there's people out there that would want to hold the book of the bee up as scripture, which is insane. This was like, we're talking a thousand years and more after the last book of scripture, the book of Revelation, was written. We're talking way down the line, 1222 AD. And despite its age, its late age, of uh, what the book of the bee is, it's the history of the world according to the Nestorians. And the Nestorians are a very little interesting uh, group, and um, they almost became a cult by this time. And Nestorius... Is this anything like Bab Babylon Bee, the Babylon Bee? Have you heard of that before? Uh -uh. <laughs> Sat satire uh, network they always have some kind of funny article on it it's pretty funny i think it's called babylon b the babylon something b something like that it's hilarious well yeah. hopefully it's nothing like that well we hope not <laughs> but it is kind of jacked up but and this is just to give you the context to understand what we're reading here the book of the b is basically the history of the world according to the nestorian viewpoint and nestorius was a bishop of constantinople in 428 and he taught something really strange. And when you read this guy's writings, you know, it's like, did he say that? What did he say? <laughs> and what he said was, is that Jesus was two persons. And he totally separated the man Christ Jesus from God Christ Jesus. And, you know, when, there's some obvious problems with that when you begin to think down the line you know, which one died on the cross? You know, you ask questions like this. But anyway, you take this teaching and you go 800 years in the future, and these guys were pretty weird, you know, yeah. bottom line. But we're going to read from the book of the bee, and we're going to be seeing things that were added into. We have the ancient tradition from the book of Jasher, which is a godly tradition, and then we're going to see this tradition that is not so godly, and we're going to look at the changes it made. Then we're going to be looking through a panorama of history, and we're going to be seeing visuals of how this is actually right before our eyes. And it's like so many things, once your eyes are opened, you're going to be look able to look at things, and, oh, there it is, you know. But we'll read from the Book of the Bee their story of the history of Moses' rod. We'll be noting the changes. When Adam and Eve went forth from paradise, Adam, as if knowing that he was never to return to his place, cut off a branch from the tree of good and evil, which is the fig tree, and took it with him and went forth. And it served him as a staff all the days of his life. After the death of Adam, his son Seth, 
took it, for there were no weapons as yet at that time. This rod was passed on from hand to hand unto Noah, and from Noah unto Shem, and it was handed down from Shem to Abraham as a blessing, as a blessed thing from the paradise of God. And Jacob, Judah, his fourth son, took it, or excuse me, after Jacob, his fourth son took it, and this is the rod which Judah gave to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, with the signet ring and his napkin, as the hire for what he had done. Now, let's just note the changes here. Uh, the first thing that's added in is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We know in Scripture, the Father said, don't eat of that tree. Well, in this tradition, not only did he eat of the tree, but he took a branch from it and made a staff out of it to take with him. Probably not the smartest thing to do. And also inserted in this is the fig tree, that it come off a fig tree. Well, the fig tree represents Israel. And this is showing a counterfeit claim to the Israel of God. These are the people in this tradition from the book of the bee. This is the staff of Nimrod tradition. And they claim to be the counterfeit Israel. And they're, we've always had this, the, the Israel of God and those that say they're not. Now, the third thing we're going to note is the insertion of Seth. There was no mention of Seth in the book of Jasher. Here we have Seth. And we did a show before about the Sethian Gnostics, how that Seth was worshipped as a god. And we're going to take this tradition right into Egypt, and we're going to see how the worship of Seth came right in centuries before, and this is what developed into the Sethian Gnostics in the, uh, well, it actually predates Christ in the Sethian Gnosticism. But we have Seth added. And also, we have Tamar added. And we know the story from Scripture, how that Judah uh, hired the prostitute and to make sure that uh, she would get her money. Judah left the staff. Now, that's probably not what you want to use your staff for. So we see these additions in the book of the bee, and they're all tainted additions, and they're there for a reason. And these are developed throughout these mystery religions and these sects that claim to be uh, the counterfeit people of God. And we're going to see this develop historically, and we're going to be able to have visuals that we're going to be able to see this pictorially. Now, we're going to read this quote from the two Babylons by Alexander Hislop, and we're going to see the tradition of the staff of Nimrod, the original shepherd king, and we're going to see the concept of the hero that's connected to it. The one, that the shepherd king that held the staff was the hero. And we'll, we'll read the quote here. The magic crook. And uh, there's a, uh, the tradition, well, this is magic. You know, it's the magical crook. Can be traced up directly to the first king of Babylon. That is Nimrod who, as stated by Bosserus, was the first that bore the title of a shepherd king. And that's a very important concept. All the way back to Nimrod, the holder of the staff, were the shepherd kings. And we're going to follow these all the way into Egypt, and we're going to identify just who they were. And in, in Hebrew, continuing with Mr. Hislop, in Hebrew or the Chaldee of the days of Abraham, Nimrod the shepherd is just Nimrod, he wrote. And from the title of the mighty hunter before the Lord, I have no doubt been, have no doubt been derived both the name of hero itself and all that hero worship which has since overspread the world. Certainly it is, that Nimrod's deified successors have generally been presented with the crook 
or crossier. Extremely important point. And this is how we identify the succession of Nimrod in the trek to the final Babylon is the possessor of the crook or the crossier. And we have here a picture of, uh, well, it's not a picture, it's a drawing. It's actually not a photograph of Nimrod, but I it's mean, a they, picture. They didn't have cameras back yeah, then, I think. Well, yeah. we don't know. I won't be <laughs> sure about that. But this is the actual uh, word hero in the Hyksos hieroglyphics. And the Hyksos are very important to our study as we get deeper into it. Wow. We're going to see the Hyksos um uh, shepherd kings and here we see it's obvious this is the hieroglyphic in Hyksos we have the crown and the the crosshair the staff and this is uh, Nimrod the original hero and we know from scripture that he was the mighty man the Gaborim the first use of the term he began to be a Gaborim a mighty man something happened to this guy and uh, his genetics got a little scrambled but we know who the original heroes were. Genesis 6 and 4, and today, you know, well, hero. Everyone wants to be a hero. But in Genesis 6 and 4, this is the Genesis 6 scenario. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in and the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And many of our new listeners, and thank God, every midnight ride and almost every show on Now You See TV or FOJC, we're getting new listeners. And we're so thankful for that. And in uh, the Genesis 6 scenario, the fallen angels had concourse with human women and they produced a race of Nephilim that were giants and there was all kinds of genetic corruption that went on uh, not only in the human but also in the animal genome. Now let's think just for a minute about all of our modern heroes. Spider-Man, well he's half human, half spider genetics. Uh, Every hero that we have in comic books from Superman on down, they are telling us the story of the, the Nephilim in Genesis 6. They're telling us the story of transhumanism. They're making these concepts popular in the masses. And I mean uh, from the youngest age, and it's all over Disney, People are obsessed with the heroes. Well, this is Nimrod, the original hero. And we could do examples from now till four in the morning of all of this. And here are just three that we picked of the use of the staff. And, we, of course, we've got Harry Potter. He had the staff. And, of course, there's Mickey Mouse, the magic mouse. And he's got his staff. And way back in 1939, we have the Wizard of Oz, and there is the Good Witch with her staff. And this is a tradition that has been popularized and uh, in Hollywood, and uh, it's just everywhere. You cannot miss it. Now, here is one of my, this is Sister Donna's all-time favorite movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. And I think probably almost everybody, young and old, has seen this movie. And in this movie, here is the uh, the scene where they had the staff, and on the there's a little uh, cutaway there of the headpiece, which was the staff of Ra. And this is the scene where they are locating uh, the location. And uh, they, of course, the light comes through. And this is the old ancient concept of the Dormer. And uh, the Dormer was used in ancient temples, and it was geared under the planet Venus. It can be proven uh, in uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland to over 3000 BC. And basically, uh, when the planet Venus would shine through like a little hole up there, a Dormer, 
when the light would shine on a certain place on the wall, they would know it was time to do the rituals. And they would do their rituals. They would ritually impregnate women on Easter. Nine months later, on Christmas, they would sacrifice the children. Uh, I, I had a teaching one time I called Lucifer's Children. And this is the concept here. And... David, before we uh, go on... Well, can sure, we, you go right we, ahead. I'll we, go back here. No, can we go back just one second? Because sure. there's a lot of new listeners, and when you talk about heroes and you talk about these Nephilim on the earth and stuff, can you explain that uh, to people that have never heard that concept before? Because I remember as a believer, when I first read the Bible with open eyes and saw that, it blew my mind. And there's a yeah. lot of people... There are, there are people listening yeah. that have never heard of that before. So can you... Yeah. Give that just a short explanation of what happened there okay. and um, the idea behind this, just, and then we'll move on from there because I want to make sure everybody understands what we're sure. talking about and that we don't overlook the fact that some people have not heard of this. Right, and this is old hat to a lot of our, well, and it's never old hat. That's not a good word because it's always, you can never wear the Word of God out. It's supernatural. But I'll read the scripture in Genesis chapter 6. We read verse 4. But in Genesis 6 and 1, it says, And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the sons of God were the fallen angels. We could prove that from cross-referencing it with the book of Job and also with the book of Enoch and with every ancient authority that commented on this and uh, with also the apostolic fathers. So we're talking about fallen angels mating with human women. And in verse 4, here are the heroes. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, unto the children, excuse me, unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. And these men of renown were the heroes. And Hercules was actually a Nephilim. And the people we see that were wrote about in the pagan religions, they were actually Nephilim that really existed. So this is what we're talking about, the heroes, you know, which were actually the Nephilim. And was it really good to be a hero? And here we have Spider-Man, Superman, all these guys, they're heroes. Well, probably not so good. And this is teaching the same Genesis 6 scenario. And this is what happened in antiquity. They're good guys. They're heroes, but they're not. It's not good. And um, it's indeed evil, and it's out of the pit of hell. Yeah, I appreciate you explaining that because a lot of people, you know, they're, if they're anything like me, I studied mythology and all that stuff when I went to college, when I went to th these, and I saw this common thread of stories all throughout what I call history personally. People call it mythology, but every civilization claims this, and there's all, always, there's, you know, proof of interesting mysteries in each of these civilizations and then the idea that it was in the bible to me was very intriguing when i first found out because that really kind of solidified um the scriptures for me at that time because i was you know becoming a new believer i didn't know what to believe what not to believe but when i saw it in the scripture it started this make sense because i had remember asking you know the pastors about that as a youngster and then be like oh it's just a bunch of crazy stuff you know the bible doesn't talk about that and you know and it really just kind of I was like, ah, what? Well, maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. And, you know, I didn't know, and so it's just, it's interesting. I'm glad you explained it, so those people can do that. If you want to move on, you're, you're good. I think people understand it now. So right, and from Nimrod and his wife Semiramis and their son Tammuz, we see the ancient worship of the father, the mother, and the child. It's the pagan. Uh, Godhead, the, the pagan trinity, if you will. And this all comes from Babylon. And with the goddess, which became the focus of the worship among the fallen ones, the goddess was known um, in, uh, in Canaan as Astarte, in Egypt as Isis, in uh, Rome as Diana, 
And now there's no difference between this pagan goddess figure, figure in the BVM and Roman Catholicism. She is the emulation of this ancient goddess figure. So when we understand that all of these different cultures are telling us the Genesis 6 story, and all of these, these gods and goddesses, they had different names in different cultures. You know, after a while, we can begin to sort this out. And we see the same thing here in this symbolism of the staff. We can watch this as it goes. We're going to see it go across all of these ancient cultures. And here in the Indiana Jones movie, it is really cool. We have the guy with the staff walking in front of this ancient depiction of the ancient Egyptian god, and he's holding the staff too. They're saying, look here, this staff he's got, it's the same ancient staff. There's a real message being sent here. And of course, at the time when I first watched this, I didn't get it. I, you know, I thought, wow, cool movie. But uh, And it is a cool, very entertaining movie. But there's a lot of, of, in this symbology, there's a real message being sent. And the guys that do these movies, they understand that. And there's a purposeful indoctrination and desensitizing of our children to these concepts to yeah. where they're really ready to accept the hero, that he's half human, half animal, animal genetics. Well, that's Spider-Man. They ain't going to bother them. And they're, they're probably ready to accept that kind of, and with now what we have with the CRISPR technology, the oh, genetic yeah. stuff, they'd be willing to accept that into part of who they are because sure. what kid doesn't want to be able to climb a building or jump higher or be stronger or fly or anything like the, along those lines. Yeah. This is an, intriguing. So what they've done with the media and with, with movies has really made it intriguing oh, to yeah. a point to where it's almost believable. And we're at a point in technology right now to where it's a real possibility that one day this could be programmed into genetics and creating Giborum, you know, in, oh, yeah. in the society. So Yeah, it's not something that maybe will happen it's happening now and people can buy, buy a crispr kit for a thousand bucks or so and it could mean the difference of with getting a baseball or football scholarship and a career worth millions so there's tremendous incentive yes. uh, obviously for this type of thing and this is all a part of this big picture now here's the the guy we know from the movie, we had the German guy, and he's got the imitation breastplate there, the high priest of Israel. And you see, that's what he's saying. Hey, we're the Israel of God. Here I am. I've got the, I'm the fig tree from the book of the bee. I've got the, the breastplate of the high priest of Israel. We've got the staff here. But you see, this is the staff of Nimrod, it's not the rod of Moses. It's imitation, uh, of course, as we know. But we can see this, how this is pictorially uh, portrayed. And this goes um, over all cultures, and we're going to see this uh, in a really broad spectrum. Now, this is a quote from a fellow that we've also talked about frequently on the Midnight Ride, because he is such a accurate, authoritative source on history and of the occult. And he's an insider. Uh, Lawrence Gardner is a 33rd degree British Freemason. He's no longer alive. He has passed on. Uh, was on Coast to Coast AM many times. I've got about a half a dozen of his books in my library. I call him Ancestry.com for Lucifer. Yeah. But the guy's sharp. And uh, he tells you their side of the story. And just to give a little bit of a background on him for people that don't know, he was the uh, director of antiquities for Scotland. He was a 33rd degree Freemason and a genealogist for a lot of these people. So he's not just some crazy conspiracy nut like us. You know, he's <laughs> not, not that we are a conspiracy nut. I shouldn't say that, but um, we're, we're not crazy. We're, 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 not, we're crazy. not crazy. I promise. <laughs> I don't have a tinfoil hat underneath here, you know. Although my kids were making me tinfoil hats the other day. They had no idea what it symbolized, but it was hilarious. They're like, here, Daddy, here's a hat. Put it on my head. Are you sure they didn't know? I, I, I don't know. They're, six, they're seven and five. They might. They've listened to my show enough. So. Well, they might have been sending a message there. Yeah. But Mr. Gardner is the insider's insider, and he has access to... Masonic libraries and information 
that are the elite of the elite. A lot of this stuff was taken right out of the Vatican in the days of Napoleon, which is another story. A lot of people don't know that Napoleon sacked the Vatican and took hundreds of crates of their rarest books, and they brought them to uh, Masonic Lodge in Paris, where Eliphas Levi uh, was one of the two men that helped categorize these stuff. And this stuff has filtered in to some of the elite Masonic libraries of the rich and the elite in all over Europe. Yeah. And this is the type of stuff we're talking about, the stuff that the average guy on the street couldn't walk in and look at. But anyway, Mr. Gardner says this in his book, The Realm of the Ring Lords. Historically, the ring was a symbol of perpetually, or perpetually divine justice, which was measured by the rod. In ancient depictions, the Sumerian goddess Lilith and the Babylonian god Marduk are individually portrayed holding the rod and ring devices. And we have it here pictorially for you. There on the left, we have Lilith depicted. She is translated in Isaiah 34 as Screech Owl in the scripture. There we see her with the rod and the ring, and there we have Marduk pictured with the rod, the ring, and the crosshair in these other uh, inscriptions and these other woodcuts that literally they're thousands of years old. So this is something that's been going on for a long time. This true, uh, this warfare with the true and the false bloodlines, the true Israel and those that claim to be the false Israel. And we see it in the Anunnaki and in the Sumerians from uh, remote antiquity. We see here in the Anunnaki, the staff portrayed, the staff and the rod. And uh, we see it in the Babylonians. We have it here in the Babylonians. Uh, their crossier and the rods. And always there's the connection between magic and also a lot of connections that look very much scientific. And we've talked a lot about how magic and science converge. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of these things, um, there's some real, when you study it and look at it, of course that's another show in itself too, that there was scientific things that were also in these pagan cultures. The idea that has been perpetuated in school, but most of us learned, was how backward these ancient civilizations were. And uh, we've come to find out that that is not the case. And the more we study, the more we see that uh, th they had so much. And I know John's done shows on this, and we have. And um, that's a whole new aspect and a fascinating one. And here we see the Egyptian pharaoh kings. And we see the, uh, the crossier uh, right there on the crossed arms of the mummy on the coffin and it's with the Egyptians that we're going to be focusing in tracing the Hyksos from uh, the Middle East down into Egypt understanding who they were and just exactly what their role is in uh, this whole thing. Now we're going to go back to the book of Jasher chapter 77 verse 47 and we're going to look at this scripture and we're going to, uh, it, well, it's just cool. Also, when he went down to Egypt, he took it into his hand and gave it to Joseph, one portion above his brethren, for Jacob had taken it by force from his brother Esau. Esau had the rod. Jacob, give me that rod, you see. Esau. The false Israel, the false fig tree, the book of the bee tradition. Jacob takes the rod out of, Is out of Esau's hand. I'm the true Israel. We see this dynamic. We've got the bloodline, the true and the false Israel concepts that are going. And we see it here in the tradition in the book of Jasher where we see the rod being taken out of Esau's hand. And of course, this symbolizes that the, and of course, we know from Scripture, Messiah comes through Jacob. 
It's hey, the David, it's, David, hey, it's a buggy again. Keep that mic close to you when you turn there, because it's okay. It's, I'm oh, yeah, no I'm problem. sorry. It's all right. <laughs> I'm a I'm a fidgety widgety here, and um, that's all I good. get. I got all this stuff going on. I just here. want to make sure people can hear all what right. you're saying there. And we know from Scripture that it's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, not Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. You know mm -hmm. that we've got. A big thing, it's the bloodline of the Messiah, the true Israel, very important. And ever since Esau sold his birthright for a bowl of soup, there is a spiritual principle in all of the seed of Esau, which became known as the Edomites and the Idumeans. Yep. They want to take back what they lost. They want what was... Uh, given to Jacob yep. but you see you can't go down to the store and buy a pound of birthright you know that comes from God and, and, and they gave it up what we were talking about before the show too is not only is there that Edom, Edom man that Edomite blood that wants to take it but you also have Ishmael who was rejected by Abraham and pushed out that he he married into that family yeah. with several of his wives that wives of, or daughters of Ishmael yeah and so they there's you got like this double people that want to take this area. And that's why you have this yeah. constant battle through history of these, the Arabs versus the Israelites. The Arabs yeah. are just nonstop, not just Arabs, but Edomites. It's interesting the way it all plays out, but uh, yeah, it people is. always wonder why can't these groups get along? Because there's this constant battle for these powers, you know, this power of being, being the uh, birthright, you know? So I am. Yeah. And this spiritual dynamic. And of course, uh, Ishmael also from the natural seed of Abraham, but not the chosen seed. And basically what Esau was doing to just spite his parents, he turned the bloodline Arab, if you will, by marrying in to all the daughters of Ishmael. So, and if you don't believe, and like I say, there's a spiritual dynamic in all of the seed of Esau to want to get back you know, what was given up to his brother. And if you don't believe this, just watch the news. It's still going on. Well, we did a, we did a show a long, a long ago about the prophecies concerning Edom taking the land while they while their, while their brother or whatever you want to call it went into bondage during that time that they actually occupied that land and, and stood out of the way while while they were taken into the far reaches of Assyria mm -hmm. and Babylon. And they took, and, and you, we talked, I don't know if you're going to get into, you probably will get into what we talked about earlier about the, about what happened after the, um, has not the Hasmonean, the Hasmonean dynasty. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll, I'll let, I won't ruin anything for you. I'll just, it's an interesting connection there. But anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Well, <laughs> you're not yeah, running yeah. a, you're not running a thing and we're going to head that direction right now. And we're going to talk about, Herod, and there were four Herods that ruled as king over Israel that were kings of the Jews, and Herod was of the line of Esau. He was an Edomite, and this is, uh, you know, just take the word Herod, look it up in your Strong's Concordance, it's the Greek 2264, this is what the word Herod means a compound of heroes, a hero. The word Herod means hero. Yeah. So here we have, at the time of Yeshua, Herod the hero, and the line of the Idumeans who claim to be the Israel of God, this spiritual impulse, they are retaking, and uh, they have absorbed themselves to where they are of uh, ruling over their brother. And you see, this is that spiritual drive that exists to this day. It's an impulse in their genetics. And unless they come to faith in Christ, they're going to be driven by, by that impulse. And, and many people would say, you know, what we're saying here is is completely way off base, but I think we've traced it pretty close through history to show that there there is, in fact, that. And the fact that you know, even even Jacob, when he tried to steal the birthright from Esau, he um, took on the guise of of Esau at the yeah. time. He took on that guise in order to get that blessing, and I think there's a little bit of that going on uh, sure today is. over there. And I'm not saying all, all of everybody that's over there is, but 
um, I think you'll find that Herod, I mean, he was called King of the Jews. And he sure was, was. He was definitely Edomite. And there's he no was doubt about the that. King of the Jews. Right. There were four of them that were, and yep. they ruled them. Yep. And this was the fulfillment. And, you know, the, the ethnic Israelites and the ethnic Edomites are all fallen. They're fallen and they need Christ. And there's this um this warfare going on. It's undeniable. I mean, that there's this conflict there. I mean, it's beyond denying, it's just a fact. Well, I mean, people would call it like, oh, we're being this or that, but the facts are we try to just go with what the truth is on the things and we try to talk about it. And sometimes it may seem to people it may be offensive to people to hear some of this stuff, but like if you really care about the truth. You're going to go where the truth leads you, and sure. you're going to look at the facts, and you're going to say, well, this is what the facts say, so this is where I have to go. Otherwise, what are, what are, we're a liar if we don't, right? You're, yeah. you, you're just a blind liar sure. turning your eyes to the truth, and there's a lot of people that do that for the sake yeah. of appeasement, but we're not those people. So No, we're not those people, are we? <laughs> right. And a lot of people want truth until it makes them feel uncomfortable. And it challenges their preconceived ideas. Then they don't want the truth so much. Yep. They want to try to alter. But it, it's amazing that the word Herod means hero. Now, we talked about this in uh, a very recent show we did on MK Ultra, mm -hmm. And we talked about this thing they did where uh, Dr. Cameron, and through the use of electricity and many other mind control techniques, they wanted to wipe a person's brain and just clean the slate, if you will. And then they wanted to reprogram their brain the way they wanted it. And this is the actual uh, uh, acronym of the CIA technique, the Electronic Dissolution of Memory, EDM. And, you know, this is a spiritual signature that um, they're aware of, I guarantee you. And uh, it would behoove us to be aware of it also. Now, here's the fellow we mentioned earlier. This is Lawrence Gardner. And we're going to look at something else Mr. Gardner had to say here. And we're going to begin to get very specific identifying who the Hyksos were, the shepherd kings, and trace their migration from the, the land of Canaan on down into Egypt. Now, this is what Mr. Gardner said in the Realm of the Ring Lords, page 64. Not only did the family of Esau inherit Edom, but they became kings of Assyria and lords of the Babylonian sea land from around 1780 B.C. Later successors of the line were the Hyksos kings of Egypt. These are the shepherd kings we're going to look at. He goes on, The shepherd guardians who reigned in the Nile Delta simultaneously with the 17th Pharaonic dynasty of Thebes. What emerges from these co-extensive tribal histories is that there were common Sumerian roots in Anunnaki times between the Kassites and the biblical family of Esau, which, as Genesis explained, descended from the patriarchs of Ur. So these Hyksos kings were Edomites, and we're going to show that they were specifically Amalek. Now, when they took over, and uh, Emmanuel Velikowski, we're going to look at some of the things he had to say, he calls them the Amalekites, the 11th plague of Egypt. Because in about 1400 B.C., when uh, we had the plagues of Egypt, there was, uh, if you read them, they were devastating. I mean, these plagues left the nation of Egypt in national chaos. They were shattered. And not only the plagues, but the fact that almost all their soldiers were drowned. In yeah. The end. I mean, they were they were yeah. ready. Yeah. So. And what the Amal Amalekites did at that time, they went in and they conquered Egypt and they reigned in Egypt until the time of King Saul. And we're going to look at the episode there when King Saul defeated the the Amalek, but he spared Agag and lost 
um, the his kingship to David, um, that the defeat of Amalek by Saul was what enabled the Egyptians to rise up and overthrow of these Hyksos kings. Now, this is the fellow that I referenced, uh, Emmanuel Velikowski, and um, he was a Russian Jew. He didn't believe in Yeshua, and when I read this guy, I said, boy, I hope he, he received Yeshua before he died, because this guy's a genius. He's like, you, he is not a believer. You don't want to look to him for spiritual truth, but like Josephus, he's like a modern-day Josephus, brilliant historian, yeah. and he synchronizes this guy can take the history of Greece, Assyria, Egypt, and he can synchronize them all with biblical history. It's some amazing stuff he does. But this is what Mr. Velikowski says, and we're going to get an even deeper look at the Hyksos and who they were. This is from Ages in Chaos, Peoples of the Sea, page 210. And he says the land was divided by the Arabs Amalekites, known as, and that isn't the word Arab, that's Arabas, uh, Amalekites, known as Amu to the Egyptians, or as Hyksos to the Greek authors. The Arab dynasty ruled for over 400 years till about 1020, and that would have been the date when Saul defeated Amalek. We see the story in 1 Samuel 15. So now there's even a more definitive, not only are they the line of Esau, but they're the line of Amalek, and they were the nasty of the nasty. They were placed under the harem of, by the father of total uh, annihilation under the holy war, the ban, and it was because in First Samuel 15 and 3 in scripture it says, now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And we know the story, Saul didn't do that. He kept the best of the animals alive for himself he spared King Agag, and because of his disobedience, we see the kingdom was taken from him. Now, we're going to make another very specific connection, and we're going to tie the hexagram as the symbol of this counterfeit line. Not only the staff, but we're going to see the hexagram. Now, this is from Emanuel Velikowski of... Ages in Chaos, page 72, and he says the name of the Hyksos king, Kion, was like that of a planet, Ki-un, star of your God. And the scripture is in Amos 5.26, and this takes us back to the, the about the 14, 1400 BC, uh, or even a little before that, in the time of the wilderness wanderings, Amos 5.26, the prophet said, But ye have borne the tabernacle of your Moloch, and Chion, your images, the star of your God, which ye made yourselves. And there's a direct connection between Chion, that was one of the star gods that was worshipped, and King Kion, of the Hyksos. It's this transliteration of the same word. So we see these Hyksos Amalekites connected to the star worship. And this was portrayed by the tabernacle and the star. And we see the, uh, the seal of Solomon, and it's the seal of Solomon. It's not the, the star of David, but the seal of Solomon. And we see this coming into the worship of Israel in the days of Solomon. He brought it in from Tyre, and it was named after him. And we know that Solomon worshipped these same gods. Scripture tells us that he built altars to them. And we see this uh, the symbol of the counterfeit Israel uh, once again surface here in this worship of the Edomites. Now, we're going to show the way that this hexagram 
is used from ancient antiquity, and we're going to show its use at Baalbek. And I know a lot of us are familiar with Baalbek, the largest stones in the world uh, that have ever been cut, bigger than anyone could cut. This mm -hmm. goes way back to antediluvian times. And throughout time, uh, I believe that Baalbek was built by the fallen ones way back way, way back. We're talking early antediluvian period at yeah. the time of the coming down to the watchers. I think this is the start. And over time, it's been destroyed and many different pagan worship sites have been built over this site for years. And in at Baalbek, the hexagram is connected with goddess worship. And Sister Donna's got some good slides here for us. And what we're looking at here, we're looking at the ceiling. We're looking up at the ceiling of the temple in Baalbek, and we're going to get a close-up. You can't. This is just to kind of give you a perspective, and we're going to give you. Uh, this is the Temple of Bacchus, the ruins of the Temple of Bacchus in Baalbek, and you're looking up at the ceiling. Now we're going to give you a close-up of it, and this is the close-up of all over the ceiling. We have these goddesses, and they're overlaid with hexagrams all over the ceiling here at Baalbek. And from uh, remote antiquity, there's the association of the, the hexagram with the line of the hyksos, and all of this as it is uh, propagated by the... Um, the uh, goddess worshipers. Now, we're going to show you a picture of the Baalbek stone. It's from uh, the German Archaeological Institute. They discovered this, and some of them are as big as 1,820 tons. Now, that's a, a big rock. And here's a perspective of uh, a man standing upon this and, you know, we're talking about big stones. And to think that these were actually made and used, you know, we're talking about uh, the giants, the Nephilim that were doing this stuff. And all the way back in uh, Genesis uh, chapter 14, it talks about the, uh, the Rephaim worshiping at the Ashtoreth Karnakim. And if you look Karnahim up, it means the two horns, literally the Ashtoreth of the two horns. And this symbolized the planet Venus because as it was traced in uh, the ancients would trace, and of course planet isn't really a planet, you know, like we're told a planet is. But as they would trace it, it would be a morning star and an evening star, and it would make like a helmet with horns on it. Mm -hmm. And it's the Vikings, it's Mithras, uh, it's the worship of the golden calf, and this is all tied directly to the planet Venus and Lucifer worship. So this is what we've got going on. We've got the ancient uh, worship of the goddess. Now, again, from Mr. Velikowski, he says, and here we're going to make an even more specific connection that we've talked about in previous shows, he says the dominion of the Amu Hyksos was not confined to Egypt. Scarabs or official seals have been found in various countries with the names of King Apop and King Kayan. In Awaras was the Sarkarium of Seth, whom the Hyksos worshipped. Now there's a big ding, ding, ding. These Hyksos worshipped Seth. We've talked about that in previous yep. shows, the Sethian Gnostics. Now here we see the worship of Seth it did not originate in Egypt. It was brought in by these Hyksos, these Amalekites. Mm -hmm. And when we see the Sethian Gnostic documents, we're going to give you a couple of looks at that. We're talking about this fallen angel religion that was brought in by these Edomites, the Amalekites. And it goes on, it says, In Aquarius was the Sarkarium of Seth, whom the Hyksos, whom the Hyksos was worshipped regarded by the Egyptians as the personification of the dark power, the contester of Isis and Horus, 
the equivalent of the Greek Typhon. And like we explained earlier, these gods who were really the Nephilim heroes, they were known by different names in different cultures. And we'll show you a picture here of old Typhon. And here we see Typhon. Uh, he's half man, he's half fish. And this is the same as in Scripture we see the goddess Dagon. And we see in the ancient Sumerian records, Oanes. It's Oanes, it's Typhon, it's Dagon. It's the original uh, beast out of the sea. And this is perpetuated in, well, guess who? Um, here's the Pope. Now, if you look at the Pope's hat, there's something a little fishy there. And in your <laughs> mind, just take the old Pope's hat and just do one of these and turn it sideways. It's a fish mouth. It's a little fishy-wishy. Uh, he's swimming with the fishes. So this is symbolized very blatantly and uh, in the, the, the hat of the Pope here. And this is from the Gnostic Bible, which is more dangerous than the Satanic Bible because there are people out there that try to put a happy face on Gnosticism. Well, I'm a wisdom seeker. I can read the Nagamati text and I'll get wisdom. No, what you'll do, you'll go straight to hell because this is the pit of hell stuff right here. And this is not the real Israel. This is the counterfeit Israel stuff here. This is the staff of Nimrod. But we have here, and of course this is Egyptian. It's from the Nagamati codices, which were found in Egypt. And this is from a text called the Gospel of the Egyptians from their baptismal ceremony. And this shows how that Seth was worshipped, just like Mr. Velikovsky says, by these Sethian Gnostics. And this came in was brought in by the Amalekites. And the text here says, Through forethought, Seth established what is holy and the baptism that surpasses the heavens. Through what is holy, through what is incorruptible, and through Jesus, who has been conceived by a living word, and with whom great Seth has been clothed. And this is what they taught. Seth was clothed with Jesus, and they worshiped Seth. And, of course, they were worshiping a devil and the devil, Satan himself. And this is from a book called The Book of the Great Invisible Spirit, also known as the Gospel to the Egyptians from the Nagamati Codices. And right here, we did this, uh, read this text on a show we did with Gary Wayne, the second incursion. And uh, it says here, then the great angel Hormos came to prepare the seed of the great Seth. Seth has a seed through the Holy Spirit in a holy body begotten by the word by means of virgins to the, to the defiled sowing of seed in this aeon. Great Seth came with his seed and he sowed it in the realms brought into the pasture land of great Seth that is Gomorrah. And others say great Seth took his crop from Gomorrah and planted it in a second location, which he named Sodom, the great incorruptible generation that has come through three worlds into this world. You know, to us, Sodom and Gomorrah, well, that was bad. God destroyed them. To them, Sodom and Gomorrah is good. That's the seed of the great set. Yeah, it was considered like a place of knowledge and wisdom. Yeah. It was almost like an Atlantis-type yeah. civilization. It's it's crazy when you really, because you're right, a lot of people use these Nag Hammadis to really kind of perpetuate their doctrine and, and prove things that they want to believe through these Nag Hammadis. But when you actually read it and you look into it and you see stuff like this, it makes it really clear oh, yeah. what's going on with that stuff. And, and I think people need to really take note of the Nag Hammadi and what it says about this stuff. Really take note and, and look at this because I'm telling you right now, all it takes is a little bit of poison to ruin the punch bowl. One that one percent, like just like just like in rat poison, one percent is, or I think it's one percent. Something, don't quote me on that. Some kind of small percentage of poison. <laughs> the rest of it's really good food, right? So yeah. otherwise, they couldn't tr trick the rat. So don't be a rat. Don't get tricked. Now, don't be a rat fink. And <laughs> when you have people 
that are using these Nagamati codices along with scripture to try to teach wisdom. That person is a rank deceiver. You better run. You better run. Because if you open your ear to it, you are playing with fire. Now, we're going to have here another striking visual. And this is the head of the Russian Greek Orthodox Church. Now, I want you to notice his staff. And at the top of his staff, we have a couple serpents. And, you know, this guy uh, looks like a rough Russian, doesn't he? And uh, the symbolism here of the staff. I thought that was Gandalf. Yeah, it <laughs> would pass for him. But it's quite an amazing staff here that is held uh, by the head of the Russian Orthodox. And the similarity between the Caduceus is uh, unmistakable. And, of course, with the Caduceus, we have the counterfeit staff with the snake around it. And we see the similarity between the staff of the priest in the Russian Orthodox Church. And this is the, the Caduceus is directly tied in, with, in Scripture to the church of Pergamos, where they had the, uh, the healing cult of Asepolis and the temple of Asepolis. That's where the original symbol of the Caduceus comes from. And in Scripture, in Revelation 2, verse 12, And to the angel of the church of Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges, I know thy works, and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. And in Scripture, we have this association of the Caduceus, this counterfeit staff with the serpent, with the very seat and throne of Satan. Now, Revelation 13, 6, it says, And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And we're going to show you some rank blasphemy that comes from the seal of Solomon. And this is one of the things that is expounded throughout the Kabbalah, and we've talked before that when you talk Kabbalah and Gnosticism, you know, you've get, just got two versions of the same poison. But here we see the hexagram, and this was drawn by Eliphas Levi, this specific symbol, which is a magical sigil. And when you look at this, on the top, we have a kindly Ancient of Days looking fellow. And, on, and you see his triangle is white. And then we have a black triangle. And at the other side, we have this flipped up. And there we got this little devil guy. And you see, this is Luciferian dualism. And this comes from the Zohar, as it was taught by Rabbi Simeon ben Joka. And this was expounded on in Eliphas Levi's Book of Splendors, which is his commentary on the Zohar, and he calls it uh, White Jehovah, Black Jehovah. And he says that the devil is just God being bad. And in Kabbalah, their God, the Ein Sof, is impersonal. And there are the ten emanations of the Seraphoth, which are ten other gods. There are many gods in Kabbalah. But the reason why the Hollywood elite, like the Kabbalah, is because... You know, you can be good, you can be bad. God is capable of doing good and bad. So, you know, this is where it breaks down. But you see here around this hexagram per per depicting white Jehovah, black Jehovah, that there is a snake swallowing its tail that is surrounding this symbol. Now, we'll give you the Masonic interpretation of what this means. And this is from A Bridge to Light by Rex Hutchins. This is published by the Scottish Rite. And what it is, it's a dumbed-down version of Morals and Dogma. And this quote originally is found in the writings of Elias Levi. It's also found in the writings 
of Albert Pike, and it's also reproduced in this book, which was published, eh, I'll say late 80s, early 90s, by the Scottish Rite. And this is their explanation of what that snake swallowing its tail around this hexagram is. There is a life principle to the world, a universal agent wherein two natures and a double current of love and wrath it is a ray detached from the glory of the sun. It is the body of the Holy Spirit, the universal ancient agent, comma, the serpent devouring its own tail. In a life of Levi and morals and dogma in Bridge Delight in the Kabbalah, this is the Holy Ghost. Now, any believer knows or I'd say most do, the unforgivable sin is blaspheming the Holy Ghost. Now, is this blaspheming the Holy Ghost to say that the Holy Ghost is this snake swallowing its own tail? If this isn't blaspheming the Holy Ghost, I don't know what it would take to qualify. And just let me get real for a minute. Uh, and I'm sure there are probably some Freemasons or people that have been through Scottish Rite that don't know this, but if you know this and you don't drop Freemasonry like a hot potato, don't tell me you have one ounce of the fear of God in you because you don't. You do not fear God and you do not know Him because this is the blasphemy of the beast and you better repent and get out of there as fast as your little feet can take you because if you don't you're going to wind up in the devil's hell this is blasphemy it's obvious blatant blasphemy of the rankest ilk now this is back to pope francis and here with pope francis we see his staff now here, Sister Donna has given us a close-up of the Jesus on Pope Francis's staff. Now, this looks just a little weird to me, you know? And you just look at this, this looks more like Iron Man or something, you know? And of course, we don't know, I don't like pictures of Jesus anyway, all of that is nothing I want anything to do with. But I mean, that's just weird. Is that, is that supposed to be one of the nails that entered... Jesus Yeshua's hand on the cross or is that is that what that is I know I was watching a show about relics earlier where they've kind of they you know took control of a lot of these relics but is that what that is going through that those? might be and maybe sister Donna can help us on that when she comes on here in just a few minutes but I think that might Eve that might be what that is but we can have her clarify that for us but I mean this is just bizarre to me this is just strange and um uh, what it looks like. Now we're going to take it deeper and we're going to show the symbolism of what this staff and of course this, the Pope um, he's got the fish hat he's got the staff he is the holder of the staff of Nimrod and we're going to look here uh, this is a picture of we saw the guy a minute ago uh, the head of the Russian Orthodox Church and here we have the Pope, and they're hugging and coming together. And what's in between them? The staff. This is swelling with symbolism. And here we have the blending of the authority, the coming together. And underneath this, we have the picture of Pope Francis with an Anglican bishop. And what does Pope Francis give the Anglican bishop? A staff. They are coming together with the staff. And the Pope is using the staff of Nimrod to pull together the, the one world church that we see prophesied. And we see the Pope doing it right now with the staff of Nimrod. And we have that brain-dead, moron heretic, Kenneth Copeland, who has the Pope on speed dial. And these people that are watching TBN and letting their minds go totally numb are following right along with the Russian Orthodox and with the Anglicans, you better wake up. Because uh, people like Copeland 
and TBN and Daystar, they're like the Pied Piper, well, the Pope's Catholic, all this, that. I mean, people better wake up because this is happening and it's happening right now. The Pope has the staff of Nimrod and he's bringing all of this together and it's happening right before our eyes and we can see it. And we see in this symbolism of the staff how this goes all the way back to Nimrod and it's happening right before our eyes. And um, this is a statement and this comes from uh, a Catholic magazine and here we have the actual explanation of the actions of Francis. It says, the Lord asks us for unity. Boy, we hear a lot about unity, don't we? Uh, Our world torn apart by all too many divisions that affect the most vulnerable begs for unity. Pope Francis told top representatives of the World Council of Churches during a prayer service at its headquarters in Geneva soon after his arrival on June 21st. The push for unity was the lead motif of his visit for the 70th anniversary of the founding of the largest ecumenical movement in the world that today represents 348 churches and 560 million Christians in 110 countries. The Catholic Church works with the Council in several ways. Don't you fall for this. And I know many of the remnant has their eyes open, but I know a lot of our new listeners might still be giving credence to TBN. And if what I said about Mr. Copeland offends you, uh, I am your strong cup of coffee. It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up because the ramifications of this are very serious. Now, in the scripture here, we see uh, back in Isaiah 14, 29, the prophecy of the return of the rod of the Assyrian. In Isaiah 14, 29, Rejoice not thou, whole Philistia, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. And this is talking about bloodline the very bloodline of this seraphim serpentine seed. And it's symbolized by the rod. And in Isaiah 10 and 5, it says, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. And of course, let's get the other side of the story in Mark 6 and 8 and commanded them that they should take nothing for their journey save a staff only. No script, no bread, no money in their purse. Why? Not because the staff was magic, but Yeshua told them to take the staff because that was the, what was on the staff? The name of God. It's a metaphor of the name and the authority of God, and they visibly carried it with them. They take the staff. Because this represents what you'll do in my name. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name. Powerful, powerful. Uh, And this is how the apostles went out, carrying the staff in direct obedience to Yeshua. It's, um, It's truly an amazing thing. And I thought I'd wind up with this scripture. We've talked about this before. And I think after unpacking uh what we have tonight, that this um, somewhat cryptic scripture from 2nd Estrus, which was in the original King James Apocrypha, it says, For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. And this controversy between Jacob and Esau, this is going to be the end of the world. Uh, Jacob took that staff from Esau. He wants it back. Yeah. And this controversy over the true and the false staff, the true and the false Israel. This is what is going to ignite the end of the world and the return of Yeshua. And I think that might make a little more sense after we have the context of the study tonight uh, to be able to process that a little. I agree. And that was a, that was an awesome presentation, David. There isn't, there isn't a lot of people that have talked about this subject. This is a 
This is a subject that really is just kind of under the radar for most people. Um, and obviously you studying this stuff for 40 years uh, helps out in that. And it's really cool. And, you know, just to kind of answer a few of the things that are in, the, you know, the YouTube chat, um, you know, people are always asking, you know, why we don't have certain people on or why we don't do that. And I, I would just say that, I, I, you know, we're under no obligation to have anybody on our show that we don't want to have on the show. Um, and that's just really the as, as pointed as I'd like to be with that. We just don't have to have people on if we don't want to have them on. And so that's that's where we're going. I've never, uh, you know, there's there was accusations that I've talked bad about a certain person in this. I've never mentioned anybody's name. Now, if we address an idea and we're anti that idea or whatever, that is if the shoe fits, wear it on that. Mm-hmm. But I just want to say that great minds question ideas and they go and they present their own ideas. And, and now in this in this in this. Um, not to get political, but in this climate we're in right now, uh, it's considered horrible to question somebody's idea or even put a notion out that somebody could be wrong because everybody's got to be right. Everybody gets a trophy nowadays, right? Well, here's the deal. We don't have to do that. That's not the way we operate. We we are allowed to question ideas, and I think that that's the only way people can grow in wisdom and grow in understanding is by questioning ideas out there, and that's about as pointed as I'd like to be about that subject, but I just want to make that clear uh, that doesn't mean we don't like somebody or don't or hate somebody. It just means that we don't agree with what they're saying, and we believe that um, what we've come to realize is is against some of that stuff. So that's that. I just want to make that very clear to people in case somebody saw the accusations that I've slandered or gone against somebody. I haven't done that, and and if you, anybody can find the proof, I'll apologize for it. There's no proof of that. I've never mentioned uh, any individual's name in the video, and uh, there you go. So. That's all I wanted to say real quick, just to end it out. I hate that I even have to mention that, but um, I just want to make sure that people understand uh, where we're coming from and that we are under no obligation to have uh, people on if we don't want to. So. No. And I don't know who you're looking at in chat, and I'm not going to um, go beyond what you said either. But I will say that without fear of equivocation, that when you have people that are teaching from the Nagamati codices along with scripture, that person is a deceiver. And I would have no trouble saying so. I wouldn't bat an eye because this stuff's out of the pit of hell. And um, I've, you know, and I've shared, um, and you know, not that I'm, I'm as rotten as anybody and as frail and subject to failure as anybody, but I am so burnt out with the this teacher. That look, look at this teacher. Look at that teacher. I'm going to lift up Yeshua, and the people I'm going to work with, not because I'm better than them. It's going to be a short list because I'm going to lift up him. We need. I wish we could all come to the place where, when they say, "Who's your favorite teacher?" People say, "Holy Ghost." You know. That's the one we need to be taught from. And that's what I tell people. You need to study the Word of God yourself and learn to be taught by the Holy Ghost. Because, you see, the truth is red hot. David, keep that mic close to you, man. Keep that mic red hot there. The truth is red hot, you see. And when we tell people the truth here that's red hot, and then we bring some guy on that's going to tell you the exact difference. The lie is cold. And when the hot meets the cold, what is that? That's lukewarm. That's abomination to God. That's going to be spewed out. So I am not going to tell you the truth on important issues and then embrace people that are telling a lie. That's the Hegelian dialectic. And you see what I'm saying when I do that is... Here's the truth, there's the lie. Well, it's okay to believe the truth or the lie. And that's not okay. That's not okay. The doctrine of Christ is absolute truth. And when we are saying what he said, we are speaking absolute truth. That's what we need. We need truth through the doctrine of Christ and the teaching of the Holy Spirit, not the Hegelian dialectic. And that's going to be my focus. And as I said... 
the list of the people I'm going to work with, it's going to be a small one because I'm going to get focused, I'm going to get real focused, and I'm going to stay focused because this is too serious to send mixed messages. We want to speak the truth because that's the only thing that's going to help people. Yeah, I mean, if we if we believe something and we, we hold heartily to truth and we know that there's a truth and we know that there's deception, if you know the knowledge that we've been given on certain aspects, there's no reason for us to, to do that, to confuse people. Because a lot of people are, um, you know, everybody's going to seek out things on their own anyway, right? The Holy Spirit guides us into all truth. Sure. But like David said, there's no reason to introduce something that we consider poison. Now, me and David are fallible human beings, just like David said. And there's always not a chance that we could be wrong on any issue, right? And if we are, part of being a scholar and part of being somebody that is into knowing the truth, we're going to make that known that, Hey, we were wrong if we were wrong. But the fact of the matter is, um, we have to, we have to hold true to our beliefs. And, and that's part of being a believer is standing fast in the word and standing fast in truth. And so, um, without wasting any more time on that, I just want people to understand that it's okay to disagree with somebody and keep, you don't have to, you don't have to invite them into your camp. You know, you don't have to keep people around you that are preaching something or saying something that you feel like might mislead people and go away. We, it's just not, it, there's no reason for it. I know some people would say beg to differ with me on that, but that's one, the one difference between standing on a line of solid truth that doesn't move yeah. and standing on a line of truth that moves around based on your feelings that day. And that's, that's not yeah. what we're about. So yeah, very so, well said. Well, is Sister Donna in the house? I better put my headphones on here. I won't know if she is or not. Are you in yes. the house, Sister Donna? Yes, I am. Yay. There we go. All right. Well, fantastic PowerPoint. Great job on that. And I know the people really enjoyed it. So. I'm going to have to pour some more coffee here, man. Yeah. So. We'll get her coffee ready Let's here. Um, rolling. So do you have some questions gathered for us? Just a few. Um, Jennifer, uh, wondered about the uh, mighty men of the knights perhaps were the giants of the Kenites I'm sorry didn't read that right sorry Jennifer wanted to know were the mighty men of the Kenites perhaps giants well whenever we see the term mighty men used in scripture uh, there's a you know, of course it talked about David's mighty men and we don't and in that context Gaborim uh, it could just mean a brave and a valiant person not always in the context of a Nephilim giant but in this counterfeit bloodline that we see coming through the Edomites whenever we see the term mighty men used there's a high probability that they were um, possessing a high percentage of Nephilim blood that would make them larger than what we would call the average human beings. Okay. Next question from Allie. There is a story of the American Medical Association logo representing Moses Rod in the desert with the fire serpent healing those who were uh, bitten could this be a lie and the real truth is maybe that it represents the AMA as the pharmacia organization that it really is with the serpents encircling the rod meaning the serpents of Pharaoh's magicians prevailing like they are declaring victory where they uh, really failed through sorcery pharmacia that's the same caduceus that you mentioned already but a uh, caduceus sure and this is exactly what the AMA wants you to think. Yeah, this rod with the snake on it, that's Moses' rod. But this is absolutely the staff of Nimrod. It's not the rod of Moses. And if you've ever read the Hippocratic Oath, if you haven't, you need to read it. And it's as much an oath to a pagan deity as any Masonic uh, organization or fraternity ever come up with. And, uh, you know, absolutely, this is another very clear example of how people want you to think that AMA rod's really the rod of Moses. Nah, that's not.
that's the wrong that's the wrong one there. That's the staff of Nimrod. That's not the rod of Moses. And if you look at the Greek god Hermes and you see his symbol, it's the same symbol that they have on the hospitals. I mean, it's Hermes, like you like you were saying. I mean, these gods gods are going to be listed as um, different names depending on where the where the language is changed, right? Because we go back to scripture to find the history on the changing of names. And we have 70 languages that shifted off and, and kind of went from language to, you know, kind of shifted off in their own languages as well. But you have different names based on that. But you have the same characteristics and symbols because these people don't speak in language. They speak in symbols and they can see the symbols and all that. But, yeah, if you just look, or go right now, Google Hermes and you'll see that symbol right there, plain and simple. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay, next question from Caesar. I saw an article in the Mason's lambskin apron represents the secret, uh, the garments of skin that Adam and Eve and how Nimrod got power like Esau. Possibly the elitist have it and know their power. Question mark. And this is just showing how close the association is and the segue that will be with another topic we're going to be top tackling of uh, Joseph's coat of many colors and the metaphor and the traditions around that. And this goes all the way back to the garden of the uh, animal skins that the father clothed Adam and Eve in. And this that's the true and the false. We've got the lambskin apron of Freemasonry. And in Freemasonry, the lambskin apron represents the virtuous conduct of the Mason whereby they're saved. And none of us are saved by our works. And we clearly teach that we are saved by grace through faith. We are sanctified by grace through faith. Romans chapter 10 says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. It doesn't say Christ is the end of the law. But we do not come to salvation or sanctification by law keeping. But the works of obedience are never called filthy rags. And this is a very uh, important concept we need to really be clear of. But this is what that lambskin apron in Freemasonry represents. It's that counterfeit cloaking of uh, the counterfeit people of God. Okay, Dave wants to know if you know, David, do you think these staffs are still around, and if so, where? Well, that's a very compelling question, and I don't know, but I suspect that There could be uh, many of these ancient staffs that are held in great reverence by a lot of these groups. And we were talking earlier about um, the relics, John and I, even before the show, about a lot of these ancient uh, relics. And, of course, a lot of it's phony, but some of it, there's something to it. Uh, the crown of thorns and things like this that, it's quite possible that some of these things are around. Yeah, and there and there's I would say there's evidence that the Templars um, really had control of a lot of this stuff. We didn't get into the whole uh, American Templar Templars coming to America and hiding relics and encoding that into some of the states' names and cities' names. We didn't get into that tonight, but there's a real um, there's a there's a mountain of evidence. Let's just say. That points to that there's a very real prov pro you know r just a real um, mountain of evidence. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. There is a mountain of evidence that points to that. I mean, they they've been looking. People have spent millions and millions and billions of dollars, man hours and manpower. Uh, you know, legions of people looking for these relics and and doing it. If they didn't believe they were there, I feel like um, those those things wouldn't happen. I mean, because we know. We know for a fact that Hitler spent lots and lots of time trying to get his hands on these relics, like the Spear of Destiny, etc. You know, et and then we know that these knights are, are the keepers of the mysteries. They've been 
in the they've been in Jerusalem long before you know long they're they're the ones that took back Jerusalem from the Arabs at the time you know it was a real um, battle for these relics I mean it, we talked about earlier how they split the cross up into three different uh, what was the ladies Helena 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 mm -hmm. uh, the mother of Constantine mm -hmm. actually split the cross into several segments and sent them to Constantinople in a couple different places and they took shards of different place and things and you have you have these stories that are probably true i mean these people spent millions upon millions of what would be considered millions upon millions of dollars today to get their hands on these things and and they really held them at a high value and um what kind of power do they have there i think that there's evidence that some of some of these relics have some kind of a cult or hidden power not necessarily the occult when i say occult the word occult just means hidden but they have a power because uh, you were talking about something earlier, Dave. Remember what you were talking about about how, about an object? Um, we were talking about the the powder, uh, the powder, yeah. and the different mm -hmm. things along that. Yeah, yeah. So, and certainly, and you know, we've done shows, several shows on the Ark too, and uh, we're going to do another one real soon too, uh, with a completely new perspective that's just deeply fascinating. Yeah. But what if Pope Francis? would produce the Ark of the Covenant and place it underneath Bernini's canopy there in Rome. What effect would it have on the world if he could genuinely produce the Ark of the Covenant? This would have sway over the minds of people all over the world. It would be huge. And that's the thing. And like John said, there is real magical, and I think sometimes there is a scientific component to these ancient things and the power that it would have over the minds of the masses we would not want to underestimate because this is how throughout the centuries these beast kingdoms have held the sway of the masses by uniting with the pagan priesthoods to control their minds and one thing too we've talked about this before but yeah uh, there was a reason that satan contended with the body of moses and there's there's possibility that the rod was buried with him uh, into a sepulcher, which the scripture says nobody knows where it is to this day. Uh, there's a, a compelling idea of that there's a compelling idea that he had the garment he had you know something who knows. But there's there's this compelling idea that it does mean something. Otherwise, the archangel wouldn't have contended with Satan over this body. So there's stuff there. Yeah, you know. Yeah, when uh, Michael wants to show up and scrap over it. <laughs> There's something about something going on there. You better yeah. believe it. Oh, relative to that question that Dave asked, if the staffs are still around, and I think someone has another question uh, similar. But in uh, October 2011, the Lord gave me a prophetic word, and in that word, He talked about uh, the the shepherd and. Uh, I'll just share that it's not too long here. Um, the Lord would say to us, I have spoken, but ye have not listened. Tell the heathen that they will be brought low. Judgment is not pretty, but necessary. The time has come for you to get serious with the Lord. Lo, I come with great vengeance, for I am a jealous God. Many days have passed, and I have warned my people, yet they do not listen. The young ones are like wild asses. They run in the streets to and fro, and the old ones try to be young again, yet none seek my face. Even those who call themselves my servants do not seek my face. The shepherds have lost control of their flocks. They have no authority to lead them. The sheep have gone astray, seeking pasture in molten fields. Oh, that I had a shepherd that would grab the sheep in the crook of their staff and pull them to safety and guide them in my ways. It's time for those who call themselves apostles to walk in the way of the master. It's time for those who are prophets to live a life worthy of the calling. It's time for those who teach not to veer from my doctrine. It's time for those who go after the lost sheep and the black sheep to get serious. It's time for those who say they follow me to follow me. Let me speak to you, my children, for I am not a God who is afar off. I am your God who loves you from everlasting to everlasting. 
Write these words, my daughter, and declare them. Let them be a testimony of my love and power. And that is what I've done. I prophesied it, I've wrote it, I've shared it, and I've declared it. He knows about those shepherd staffs. He mentioned it in that word. And uh, so on, what? I'm sorry. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah connected a lot of these concepts in chapter 3 of uh, 15 and 16. He says, and I will give you pastors according to mine heart. So there's some good shepherds coming, don't worry, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. And it shall come to pass when ye be multiplied and increased in the land. In those days, saith the Lord, they shall say no more, the ark of the covenant of the Lord Neither shall it come to mind, neither shall they remember it, neither shall they visit it, neither shall that be done anymore. And it's amazing in this scripture, it talks about a time when the ark will be visited. Like maybe someone's going to have a third of visit. So it's, it's interesting how these concepts are blended together in prophecy. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, the next question is um, from uh, Jason. Um, would it be possible that David's mighty men were also part Nephilim, uh, but because they walked in righteousness and fought for Yahweh's army, they were not judged as the other Nephilim in the promised land? And we did a show with Gary Wayne on this, and we looked at that. And I remember uh, we found some of David's mighty men that had kind of a questionable heritage, if you look at their genealogies. I would say for the most part, no. We don't want to think of David as leading a Nephilim army. Yet we could not rule it out that there were some people that were from... Um, those pagan nations that some of them had suspect genealogies. And, you know, even when we think about the book of Galatians, the book of Galatians were the Gallic people. They had a high percentage of Nephilim blood, but yet Paul wrote the epistle to the Galatians and many of them were saved. And at the time it was said of the Gauls, they were the tallest people in the world. So, you know, uh, we kind of have to put it in that kind of a perspective because by that time, uh, you know, the early giants in the antediluvian period, they were tall as cedars. You're talking 200 feet tall, huge. And uh, by the time of Goliath, he was just a little guy. You know, he was just about 10, 12 feet tall, just a small fella. So, you know, over time, as that bloodline was watered down, uh, you know, we're not talking about giants. We're talking about people that could have had Nephilim blood that would have made them normal than human beings, but, you know, not like we would think of antediluvian Nephilim. And before we go to this next question, I want to take some time out and, and do something. Uh, and if you're listening, sponsor, I will give you guys an extra shout out for the week. But Joshua Watts is our sponsor for this show. Joshua Watts, the leather company. And David, <laughs> can you can you hand me that bag you have that he made? Yeah, I'll I'm, get it. Yes. Talk about, uh, <laughs> we'll give you an extra week for free, and I'm going to throw this one out here. Joshua, I appreciate you guys sponsoring the show. But go ahead and get that, David. I want to show you guys some of the stuff that he's made. And I don't have, uh, other than David's awesome bag that looks like, um, he pulled it right off of John Wayne's uh, carcass and brought it into here. It's really cool. But he's done a lot of covers for Bibles, uh, gun holsters, rifle uh, holsters for people. Really, really good stuff. Bracelets, etc. But this is one of the bags here. Let me actually switch cameras here and show you guys on this camera. If you guys can see that. It's a Midnight Ride bag. And... Um, it's really awesome. It's a book bag that David uses all the time. Really well done. Smells really good, too. You guys can see me smelling that. It's really good. But there's a, a ton of stuff that he's done. I wish I had more of the stuff here with me uh, right now. But please support him. JoshuaWattsLeather.com. Go there. Check out his stuff. 
um, int- stuff. And I'm sorry, man. I am really sorry because I know he's been I, – I forgot last week, this week. I'll give you an extra week for free. I apologize. We love you, Joshua Watts. You know that. And thank you for everything you've done. So, <laughs> Yeah, would have been loved to, pl- to plug it maybe – not 10 minutes before the show's over. Yeah. We just didn't remember to do it. <laughs> We're yeah. too busy. We're too busy vanquishing evil here to, to think <laughs> about that. He does such a good oh, job. Oh, he does. And, uh, I mean, that bag there, you wouldn't have known what I stole at right off Indiana Jones himself, yep. you know. You just wouldn't know. <laughs> Okay, next question. Um, could this rod of Moses be something that the false prophet could claim to have any try and absurd authority as to uh, bring worship to the beast? Oh, yeah. And you yeah. can see it right there. The Pope's got it now. The Pope's staff, and absolutely. And I, and you know, what does it say in Scripture? That the false prophet, you know, and most people because of our Uh, most people have their prophetic understanding from fiction movies. And that's what I call the left behind, their fables. But the false prophet, who is the second beast in Revelation 13, he causes all the world to worship the first beast through his miracles. And oh yeah, uh, we're going to see, and I believe that one of the popes of Rome will be the final false prophet, and he will have his staff, and he will do miracles, even the calling of fire down from heaven. So, yeah, you've got the perfect idea here of uh, what's going to come down. And like David, like you said earlier in the show, there's always an imitation. Yeah. And in the in the book of Zechariah, I believe, um, 11, Zechariah 11, it talks about the evil shepherd. Yeah. And it talks about how, what what he's going to do and it also ta- i think jeremiah uh, is it jeremiah 23 that talks about the evil shepherds what yeah the, the shepherds, shepherds jeremiah 23 is about the shepherds and if you can look at that you can see what what the game is for them it even talks yeah. about darkening the right eye and we know about the one-eyed god yeah. we see these we see this symbolism in the scripture the scripture knows all the mysteries all the mysteries are within the bible uh we don't even need to look outside of the scripture to find the mysteries but it's amazing uh, when you can tie in all these other things as well. And and the reason we tie them in is not because we need these other things. It's because we want to reach out to people that have looked at the mysteries and they can see, wow, the Bible does talk about these things because it is the most um, the most ancient, the most true historically, archaeologically. The scriptures are the most true, period. There's no other book that you can go through the archaeology of things that can be proven and found and find the accuracies. There's no other... 66 compilation of books or 67 what i believe in the book of enoch that you can find a a synchronicity in that many authors putting together books you don't find that in the occult books you can look at uh, all these books and they all have stuff that's just completely um contradictory but not with the scriptures it's an amazing thing there's something supernatural about it and and just amazing and that's what me and david have come to find and we're so thankful that we have because um, you know, this is, this is what it's all about is finding the truth. The Bible says, seek with your whole heart and you will find, and this is seek with your whole heart. Ask, ask the father for wisdom, the fear of the most high, the fear of Yahweh, the fear of God, however, however you say his name, Yahovah, Yahuwah, whatever the fear of him, YHVH is the beginning of all wisdom, the beginning of all wisdom. And you have to fear him because he's the only one. They can take the breath right out of your body. So I, I definitely urge each one and each and every one of you that are listening to do that. So, and like they say, you're not going to get that anywhere else but in the scriptures. And we began our presentation this evening by laying out the scriptures and this idea of the satanic imitation, the true shepherd, the false shepherd, and if we have this concept. It will help us to see the evil workings that are unfolding in this area and many areas. Satan is always the imitator, and the father is the original. And speaking of imitations, I wanted to clarify what you asked originally. Somebody was asking, and you questioned about the pastoral staff that the Pope 
celebrate. Well, for one thing, he carries a lot of different ones, and I did have some of their pictures, but we chose not to include them in the slide presentation. And I also had this quote here. It says, um, Pope Francis carries a pastoral staff as he celebrates the opening mass of the Synod of Bishops on Young People, the Faith and Vocational Discernment at the Vatican, October 3rd, 2018. Although difficult to identify from a distance, the figure of Jesus on the cross, his arms nailed above him, is carved into the bamboo staff, which was given to the Pope by a group of young Italians with whom he met at the Circus Massimo in Rome on the 11th of August. The bamboo staff showed that the torn-hearted Jesus on the cross guarded a small seed, and that seed dies to bear fruit and our hope. Once again, a flowery explanation for something that he's trying to promote. Yeah. Um, and I found, that, like I said, I had other pictures of the staffs, and uh, one of them actually looked like a snake. It's a newer one that he has. It's not even, it's not Jesus on the cross at all, and he he has a, you know, he just carries a bunch of different ones. So you never know what he's going to come up with. Okay, uh, uh, Riku has a question. Uh, for either one of you, is it possible when all the animals came to Noah to go into the ark, Noah used the garment of Adam and Eve or the staff to command the animals to come to him to go into the ark? If you don't mind, uh, there is a legend that goes along with the, the garments that because it was made out of the animal skin that that gave them the power to control the animals and have dominion over the animals, which who knows if that's true, but that's that there is a legend about that that I can't remember where I found that reference in doing the research on the garment, but that is part of the um, legend of this garment. So mm -hmm. other than that, well, I don't I, I don't know. I did a teaching one time, and actually, the animal's blood was the first blood that was ever shed to make the garments for Adam and Eve. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people don't realize that, but it talks about that I think in Genesis chapter nine. Yeah. Okay. True. Um. Next question. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, what uh, rod did the angel measure the New Jerusalem with? From Christine. Well, we don't know what rod it was, but it's very interesting that in Revelation 11, which talks about the measuring, the sizing up, of the temple of God, which is believers, for judgment. So, the symbol, and like we've said... the Closer to the mic, David, please. Oh, and like we've said, the rod is a metaphor that's used for judgment and for authority. And here again, we see that metaphor coming through in Revelation 11. And... You know, just like Noah, we see in the book of Jasher, the tradition that Noah had the rod passed down to him. Now, I don't, we don't know if Noah had a rod in his hand. It doesn't tell us in Scripture that he had the rod when uh, the animals went in. I think very well he might have had a rod. And you see, here again, what's important is the metaphor, that we understand that just like the early disciples, Yeshua said, take a real staff with you, that we can have the staff of God when we have the authority that comes through relationship and we can act in the name of Jesus, just like um, was originally uh, on this rod, the name of God, according to the book of Jasher. That's the important thing for us to understand. Okay, Jennifer has a question. Um, I've heard this theory that uh, Esau, who also could have been Nephilim, uh, could have Nephilim physical attributes. Any truth to that? I would tend to not believe that because Esau, being Jacob's brother, you know, if we have Esau with Nephilim blood, well, then we'd have Jacob with Nephilim blood. And that's, I do not believe that that would be the case. 
and, and, I, and I've heard that theory before too. But I and I like I like David believe that that's probably not true. I know that people are like, oh, he was hairy, so he had to be yeah. genetically different. But but the fact of the matter is, men and women back then, the original DNA of men and women, they were probably very big, very smart. Uh, you realize as DNA goes on, there's copies of copies of copies. We kind of get more diluted as time goes on, which kind of goes against the theory of evolution. But our DNA gets more diluted over time. We get smaller. We get less smart. We get all these different things. Now, there is a burst of in knowledge of information, but we've talked about where we think that might come from um, you know, over time. And there are super, like men that come out of nowhere with this occult wisdom or whatever. But um, – I, I tend to believe that the humans back then were big, beastly people, like big men. I mean, they, they probably could contend with some giants. They probably were pretty big guys. I mean, um, that would be my guess, just going by the idea of DNA and how how DNA had so much more compacted in it. I mean, how how else can you get every race of mankind, black, white, yellow, whatever, out of two people right how else can you do that other than the dna is so compact just like a wolf every every dog comes from the wolf's dna every dog go all the way from the little pug which i got the little <laughs> snorting pugs all the way to the huge saint bernards or great pyrenees these are all come from the same dna yeah and spread out over time so um understanding how dna works and stuff like that is is really which is i feel like a lot of a lot of people that have these theories and stuff may not understand the way DNA could have worked back then. Um, and that's just, that's just, but my, when you my think opinion. about the lifestyle that the people, I mean, the physical lifestyle, they had to be tough to make it, to do all the work they had oh, to yeah. do and to survive life. They had to be pretty strong in order to do that. Yeah. Um, Caesar and what you're talking. saying is, is they weren't Nancy boys that used Gillette razors. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's, that's, that's so another true. subject. That's a fact right there. You know, that's a fact. Caesar's question is, can the rod or staff or wand be a falling angel technology? Because according to the legend of the Incas founded the empire using a golden rod. So is there another legend that Merlin the wizard used a magic wand to build Stonehenge? Well, we've alluded to this at a couple times throughout the presentation tonight, and this could be an entire presentation. We have talked about this, that there is both the magical and the scientific element associated with ancient arcs and ancient rods, and I think there definitely is that component there. And in the study of ancient arcs that were used in the mystery religion that were associated with magical powers, it really looks that there was a scientific element as well. And always there's this blending, even to this day, the bl blending of the magical with the scientific. So I think that element is certainly there in this rod tradition also. Trey has a wordy but relevant question here. She was embarrassed because it was, or he, I'm sorry, I don't know if it's he or she. Trey, probably he. Uh, anyway, since Yeshua is crucified by the Romans and the Talmudic Jews, and we are more than likely to suffer like him if we are indeed in the last days, so does that mean that we will be more likely slain by the Roman papacy and the Jews? Is it more, repeat the last part of that, please. Okay. Is it, um, so does that mean that we will be more than likely slain by the Roman papacy and the Jews? Since Jesus was at that point. Yes. <laughs> and I'll give you a truncated synopsis of what I believe that I've talked about many times. That I believe the final that the false prophet in Revelation 13, which is the second beast out of the land, I believe he will be one of the popes of Rome. And I believe that the first beast out of the sea is a coalition. And I believe that one of the presidents of the United States will be the final beast 
the first beast of Revelation 13. And if you look at the alliance today, I believe the little horn is the American Israeli British military alliance. It's an obvious alliance. Who can make war with the beast? And I know John has done shows and we've done shows together connecting uh, Israel with the beast and mystery Babylon. So yes, just like then, so will it be. It will be the Rome and the Israeli American British alliance, the little horn that will persecute Christians in the last days. I believe what you've described is exactly the way it's going to be. And if I could add that uh, Matthew ten seventeen it says, uh, and if this is talking about end times, which I believe it is, it says, Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to the courts and flog you in the synagogues. And that word synagogues is, is really key there. And when you have these things like the Noahide laws that are gaining ground right now, uh, which are very, uh, for Christians, you're going to be, that you're out, right? Noahide laws make you out because that is considered idolatry to worship Yeshua or to even look to him as anything is considered idolatry sure. uh, by the Noahide laws. Sure. And so, uh, and, and also the, the abomination of desolations and the man of sin will actually sit in the temple, whatever that temple may be. Uh, however you want to look at that scripture, he's going to sit in that temple and people of, they're going to worship him right there from Israel, Jerusalem, right? The, this is going to happen. So, a uh, very, very keen thought there, yeah, I think, in, in general. I think that's really, really uh, interesting and true, I mean, most likely. So. Oh, yeah. And Thanks, John. Could it be that the spirit of Antichrist is sitting in the temple of the body of Christ now, making them think that that nation of Israel and the genetic Hebrews, that they are the Israel of God? Could that be? Could that be defiling the temple right now? I believe so. Good point. And there was only one other person mentioned. I don't know if you knew about the Noahide laws, but I was going to save that one because I knew you did. And uh, Dave had one question here. He says, I've heard that there is something to do with the number of prongs on the top of the staff. Two means one. One, three mean, oh, excuse me, two means one thing, three another, etc. What is all this stuff? Well, I can't unpack all that for you, Dave, but I know there's something to it. And like the, the three-pronged staff is a rod or staff is a trident. And this is the symbol of Atlantis and of the beast out of the sea. So there's the trident symbolism. And I don't know what all of the two and all this is, but I know that the three is the trident of Atlantis. And I do know that every little thing on these rods, that there's a symbolic meaning attached to it. And that these people are very aware of this. And, you know, we need to also be wise as serpents and harmless as doves as we look and see the the messages they're sending and boy this sends message when you see the russian the head of the russian orthodox uh church hugging the church of rome with the staff in between you better believe that sends a message and the same with the anglican so absolutely there's a meaning to all of these things and you know i know that's that's all the questions i just wanted to say i know there's people sometimes that think we're too hard on catholics but we yearn for the Catholics to learn who Jesus really is because so many of them are not, have never been allowed even to read the Bible. And that has changed a lot recently in the latter years, but they still don't know the truth and they're being deceived. And we love the Catholic people. We have a lot of friends that are Catholic. We have some uh, friends that are Catholics that are yeah, really Yeah, and we, nice I mean, we're that. friends with the people that, had the Catholic bookstore up in a little town north of here. And so we, we've been around people like that forever. We know what they're, we know a lot of them are so sincere and there's probably some saved Catholics out there. There's some saved Catholics in about every denomination there is, but they need to realize that they're being deceived. And that's what 
NICTV and FOJC radio is all about is to try to teach people the truth. There's so people deceived too, truth. Donna, in every in every uh, denomination, Protestant, Hebrew oh, roots, you better believe it. Uh, you name it. There's deception that runs deep in all of these uh, all of these denominations because as soon as you put yourself into a denomination. You put yourself into something created by a man, right? Because denominations sure. aren't right. a God-made sure. thing. And uh, when, back to the Catholics, I'll give the Catholics some of the Catholics credit. I mean, uh, so there, who are outside these clinics protesting? We were talking right. about that on the yeah. way up. Yeah, yeah. And so, and you know, there's some devoted people in there, and even people that are starting to see something's not right here. You know, I saw one of my Catholic friends that that we know, we both know. Uh, saying i think we have a bad pope here you know what i mean starting to starting to <laughs> yeah question thanks see, sparky <laughs> yeah starting to see these things go down and we want to we want to welcome you guys into the into the whatever we got going on here just really you know you have to believe what the father tells you men tend to be fallible and that you can always count on that nobody's perfect i'm not perfect david's not perfect donna's not perfect none of you guys out here are perfect um now I'm sure David would say Donna's pretty close, right? Donna's pretty close. As yeah, close no, no, no. as anyone I've ever seen. Really. <laughs> no. About as close as you're gonna get. Better watch that, David. You can lie uh, you fry. Yeah. Honey. Uh, just kidding. Um, he you know, when you live with someone, you always see the worst of them. And uh, and but we've lasted forty years, so we're still there. We're still, we're still uh, seeing the worst we're and still seeing the best. going. And if my wife's listening you're pretty perfect. I love you. So, <laughs> <laughs> and and here's the thing: the scripture says that the fear of the Lord is to hate every false way. And I hate Catholicism, and I'm very rough on it. I am very rough on Judaism. I am very rough on Freemasonry. But I do not hate these people. I really don't. Uh, I don't have animosity. That's the goal, is to free people from the ensnarement of these false belief systems. And like John, and I am very hard on the evangelical church. You know, I tell people that if you have Freemasonry and the worship of the pagan holidays, to get out of it. I don't hate people that are in churches. We have family in churches, and uh, we don't hate these people. But our message is, is to come out of Babylon and to turn to Yeshua and his doctrine with all of your heart before it's too late. Because all of these systems of man are ensnaring people. And it's time to be free in Yeshua and to follow him led by the Holy Spirit. And that's what it's all about. That's right. And David, uh, yeah. as far as I know, that was the last question, was it not, Donna? Yes, it was. Mm -hmm. Well, how about that? And I just want to thank you, Sister Donna, for a great PowerPoint and uh, a lot of work um, on that. And I want to thank John, as always, for um, all that he does and uh, all that he makes possible. And... We just want y'all to pray for us and pray for us that next week we can remember Joshua Watts before 10 minutes before the show's over. So, so maybe we will. But um, we do uh, appreciate you, the Now You See TV listeners, your love for truth. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to search out matters. We're going to lift up Yeshua. And we're going to preach the gospel of the kingdom and the doctrine of Christ. And uh, look for the, the soon return of our great king. So with that, God bless you all. And we will... Oh, one more thing, John. One more thing. Somebody had a question, the Hawkeye and Super Chat. What was the question? Somebody pass it to me real quick while we got a second. Um, I just want to do it because he... he He's got a question. He was in the super chat, and I like to okay. make sure people that support us on here get the uh, get the question. Tell me what the question is. I didn't see it. While you're waiting on that, what is the super chat? Well, on YouTube, they have this thing called super chat where you can uh, donate money on there, mm -hmm. and then your question gets highlighted. But I don't know how to 
know how to I see didn't it. even know we had a super chat. Yeah, okay, I see. I see it now. I figured it out. I'm sorry. Forgive me. The older I get, the more technology seems hard, and I'm not that old, so it's it's moving I'm really fast. That one. It says, "Thank you, now you see TV. Can you tell me if children born with autism and other mental disorders will make it to heaven? Thank you, and God bless everyone." Absolutely, they will. Amen. And, and I believe, um, and just like uh, young children, and I, I can't pull up the scripture for you, but there's a scripture in Romans that talks about the justification of all at birth in the sense that little babies are innocent and they are in the grace of God. It doesn't matter if, uh, if a little Muslim baby is killed or a Hindu. That child is under the atonement until they're accountable and they, they willfully turn away from it and willfully begin to sin and be accountable. They're born fallen, but they're not accountable until uh, they can sin and be accountable. But uh, absolutely, and my mind is straying, I lost track of it. Well, there's a scripture in Romans 5 and 18. It says, therefore, oh, as by the I offense remember. of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation, even so by the righteousness of one free gift came upon all men unto justification for life. Yeah, and like um, I worked with people that were uh, challenged uh, mentally for many years, and I know there was this one fella, I would talk to him about Jesus, and he'd be going real good for a while, and then he'd get Jesus confused with Spider-Man, <laughs> and it would kind of be blended in together, you know? And I believe that many of these people, that they're in a state of innocence and grace all their life, and when they die, they're going to go to be with Jesus. You can you can bet. But they're precious in the sight of God, and um, absolutely, they're under the blood. All right, David, end us out, man. Let's get, let's All get right. this going out of here. Well, I think we have gave our thank yous. So with that, hey, it's time for that midnight ride high five. High five, everybody. We'll see All you right. next Saturday night on the midnight ride. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Thank you.